Hello, hello. Is anybody there? Am I here? Who knows? Right. <laughs> here I am. I'm really sorry. Complete chaos. I've only just finished with a candidate. Yevgeny's not coming. Um, it's very bright here, isn't it? <laughs> oh, my microphone's probably sounding terrible as well. So whilst I fiddle around with the lighting, can someone just let me know whether you can hear me properly or not? Just a, yeah, GG, you sound okay. We hear you type thing will be fine. And I will try and sort out the brightness of the camera because that looks horrible. Here we go. Zoom, color adjustment, uh, original. Oh, that's even worse, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This is terrible. Let me get. Oh, there we go. There we go. That's much better, isn't it? That's much better. Okay, so welcome, welcome. Looks like we've got a bijou group of people today, which is fine. Amazon has massively slowed down their hiring, so all is getting a little bit quiet in the world of day one careers. So I am on my own today. Evgeny is not joining us. So sorry, it's just me, which means it tends to be a little bit more of a stilted session rather than being able to flow quickly between myself and Yevgeny, but I'm sure you will forgive me. So let me just introduce myself. Um, I'm going to just close the window in my office as well because I can hear some background noise. So sorry, two seconds, please. Right, there we go. That's better. So I am Gigi and I am an ex uh, Amazon bar raiser here at Day One Careers to give you a little bit of a background as to how I got into this wonderful world that we're in. Uh, I mentioned that I worked for Amazon. I worked there for just, just about five years in a couple of different business units here in the UK. Um, whilst I was at Amazon, as all Amazonians do, I did a huge amount of interviewing. And as part of that, I became a bar raiser. I'm sure you all know what a bar raiser is. If you don't, you can always ask me in the comments in a second. And one thing that I particularly noticed when I was a bar raiser was you can really tell the difference between people who had had really expert Amazon interview kind of preparation, who had spoken to or seen content from someone who'd actually worked at Amazon and had actually done quite a lot of interviewing versus the people that hadn't and didn't. You know, obviously the people that had knew what to say, knew the buzzwords, knew what not to do as much as what to do. And you could see how different it was between the two. Being a good Amazonian, I got a little bit curious as to how that would happen. I started to ask candidates, oh, you seem really well prepared, kind of how, how has that happened? And I started to hear stories about people having one-to-one -one prep, uh, working with coaches, blah, blah, blah. I then got even more curious and thought I would look into kind of how much that costs because, hmm, you know, curious. And I discovered at the time, and it was a few years ago now, it was pretty pricey. Some of these people were paying like two and a half thousand dollars a month for some coaching, which seemed to me, uh, well, I will say extortionate and unfair and, uh, you know, certainly um, not inclusive. So I just thought I'd start a YouTube channel, which I did. Whilst I was working at Amazon, I started this uh, YouTube ch channel under the guise of the Amazon interview whiz. I was supported internally. I got onto the internal uh, newsletters and all sorts of exciting things. I left Amazon a while later and decided I would see if I could turn this into a little bit of a side castle, pay a few bills whilst I wasn't working and started up the Amazon interview whiz basically offering digital courses to prep candidates while still building out the YouTube channel for all of this free content. I happened to then meet Yevgeny, who isn't here today. We decided to join forces and we created Day One Careers. So what we do at Day One Careers is we have obviously this extensive YouTube channel. We do these free Q&A sessions every single Monday. We have a digital course um, that we're incredibly proud of and I will give you a free taste of if you stay until the end, which reminds me I must do the ticker tape. He always does the ticker tape and I always forget it. So let me just quickly get it going. There we go. Um, free course at the end. So make sure you stay because I promise you, you'll absolutely love that. We post content on YouTube. We're a bit rubbish at Twitter. I'm starting to build up a TikTok channel. So if you're on TikTok, please follow me. My TikTok following is pathetic. I had, I think I had about, I don't know, seven or 8,000 and then TikTok canceled my account and it was all gone. 
So about a month ago, I had to start completely from scratch. And I think I have something like 44 followers at the moment. So if you're on TikTok, please come follow me and make me feel less sad and embarrassed about my following there. So what we do at this session is it's super obvious, right, everyone? You just ask me questions here on the right and I will endeavor to answer them. A couple of rules. Please don't ask me really, really vague questions like, Gigi, I have a program manager interview tomorrow. Any tips? Because I'm going to say, yeah, an entire YouTube channel full of them. Please go look at the YouTube channel. Equally, please don't ask me anything too specific, i.e., Gigi, I'm having an interview tomorrow for a principal technical program manager for Prime. What type of technical questions can I expect? I can't give you that level of specificity because there are tens of thousands of job families in Amazon and no one person can know that level of detail about that many different roles. So please don't ask me anything super, super specific like that. Neither something super vague. Anything in the middle will be fine. Um, what else do I need to tell you? I think that's about it. So please do ask your questions here. I can see there are a couple of popping up on the right. It is very quiet at the moment. I'm sure you all know that Amazon has really, really ramped back their hiring as most companies have. The world has gone mad. Usually we run this for an hour, but I suspect we won't last that long this time because there just aren't that many people who are um, interviewing at Amazon at the moment. So we'll see how far we go and hey ho, I'm available until six, even if you guys don't need me until then. Oh, guys, I will try very careful not to use that type of loaded language. It's a very it's a it's a learning experience for someone as old as me. All right. So let's just get going. We'll answer some questions and we'll see how we get on. So I'll say hi to people as well, because it's just nice. So hi, Code with Rohit. Oh, Code with Rohit. Hmm. Interesting. I might check out your channel, Code with Rohit. Sounds interesting. Luigi, thank you very much. Hello. Oh, Elheny, I hope I've got that right. I do apologize to anyone whose name I butcher. I will do my best, but I obviously have my caught in my old little English accent here. So code with Rohit. I'm going to pull up your question. Ah, OK, let's pull this up. So code with Rohit. You're having your hiring manager around. Can I change this view so that can I do this? No, no you're stuck with me. So I have to sit up. OK, you're having your hiring manager around on the 7th of October. OK, so that's five days away. You already had your bar raise around. OK, for a support engineer, too. OK, can you expect technical and behavioral just behavioral? All right. So. Hmm. Um, oh, do you know what? Alexa's going in the background. Hang on. Let me just get rid of Alexa. Hang on. I was wondering what that weird talking was in the background. I forgot I had my Alexa on. So code with Rohit, I'm a little unclear uh, as to whether you're, you're, you can't be at loop. You can't be doing um, loop on site, final round, whatever you're talking about, whatever it is, because your sessions are so far apart. I don't think anyway, if you had one already and your next one isn't for another five, four, five days, that doesn't sound like loop to me. And if it's not loop, then you can't possibly have had a bar raiser. So I'm really utterly confused, Code with Rohit. So what I want you to tell me, Code with Rohit, is where are you in the interview process? Have you had one interview? Have you had two interviews? And now you're at the final stage loop, which is meeting with multiple people in close succession. I can give you some guidance, but I'm confused because you've used the word bar raiser in there and you cannot have met a bar raiser if you're at unless you're at loop and because of the spacing of the story that you've just told me you I don't think you can be at loop so it's it's a bit confusing so please just a little bit later on just be clear with me how many interviews have you had what stage are you at don't tell me who you think you've met because that's confusing but how many rounds have you had so far Okay, moving on then. Salesforce guy. Oh, hi, Salesforce guy. I used to work for Gavin Patterson, Salesforce guy. Uh, you know, just name dropping as you do. So, uh, oh, <laughs> I hadn't read this before. I pulled it over. Congratulations, Salesforce guy. So, I, I guess you're no longer Salesforce guy, right? You're Amazon guy. I hate the fact that this is, I'm going to lift my chair up. I don't even know if I can do that. I don't know how to change the settings on my chair. Maybe I have to sit on a box or something. 
Hmm. I'm going to sit on a box. <laughs> Hang on. I'm so far down. Change the set. There we go. There we go. <laughs> That's better. Congratulations, Salesforce guy. And you can now make yourself Amazon guy. Um, I'm so delighted that the content was able to help you. And uh, yeah, have an amazing career. Congrats. All right. Okay. Uh, all right, Gita. Okay, so this isn't an interview question per se. You're kind of asking me something about Amazon internal policies for moving people around. So you just got promoted to an L4 six months back and you want to try for an L4 program manager in the US. Can you try for this role from India, Bangalore? Um, okay. Now, the policy when I was there, and bear in mind, please, that I left a couple of years ago, was that you could not transfer to internationally at an L4 level. You had to be at an L5 level. Um, now, I believe that's still true because I have had somebody else who's an L4 Amazonian in India tell me they wanted to do the same. I gave them that feedback. They then did their research and discovered I was right. So my understanding is no, you cannot at an L4 level transfer internationally. But I would suggest that rather than taking my word for it, that you do some research of your own on inside Amazon or speaking to your HRBP to find out if, or your manager, to find out if that is actually the case for you. Okay, moving on. Oh, okay. El Henny, hello. So can I tell you what happens after the interview rounds? There's a vote or something between the interviewers. Okay, so there is a video on the YouTube channel that talks about how the, I think it's how the Amazon interview process works is the video, but I will summarize it up for you here. There are many different pathways that people can go through in their Amazon interview process. That's because teams have quite a lot of choice about how they use the different elements of the interview process. So some people do an online assessment and just go straight to the final round loop on site, whatever you want to call it. Other people do online assessment and a first round, which is often called a phone screen, and then get moved to loop. Other people do the online assessment, a first round phone screen, and then a second round phone screen, and then get moved to loop, right? So you just bear in mind that there are lots of permutations of what that process might look like. If we're talking early rounds, so phone screen one, phone screen two, which you may or may not get based on what I just said a minute ago, your interviewer interviews you based on their personal assessment of you against a standard which they understand. They will on their own decide whether to move you on to the next round or not, right? And that next round could be a second phone screen or a loop. As I mentioned, it could be many different things. Okay, so in early rounds, it's one person, one decision, okay? Once you get through to the final stage, loop, panel, on-site, whatever anybody's calling it, this can also have variations depending on your level and depending on your role. Somewhere between, let's say, three and eight interviews could happen in the final round. Some people may have to meet a bar raiser and be interviewed by a, by a bar raiser. Some people may not have to be interviewed by a bar raiser. OK, just hold this in your head as I describe it. What happens is everyone will interview you, whoever's going to interview. They capture notes at the time. When their interview finishes, they reread those notes. They reflect on what they're looking for, the leadership principles, what they're looking for in your answers from the leadership principles, who they work with, how you compare to the people that they work with already at that level in similar roles. And they decide whether based only on that information, if they would choose to hire you or not. And they place a little vote in the system, which is called hire, funnily enough, as to whether based on that information and that information alone, they would hire you. Right. Then anybody else in the group who have interviewed you, who has also already placed that vote, gets to see their information. So slowly, as everyone starts to place their vote, information becomes more available and everyone gets to see everybody else's information. They are required to read all of that information. They then all go into something called a debrief. Now, for some specific programs, the, the process is a bit different. Grad recruiting, MBA recruiting, some of those things are a bit different to this process, but this is the core process. They sit in a 30-minute meeting led by the bar raiser. 
As I mentioned, some people will have been interviewed by the bar raiser. Some people will never have met that bar raiser and the bar raiser is required to facilitate that meeting just reading the notes of the people that did interview you. But this meeting happens with the bar raiser. They look at the leadership principles. Different bar raisers do it slightly differently. Some will look at all leadership principles. Some will only look at the key leadership principles for the role and they will discuss you discuss the data that's been gathered, discuss your performance, discuss the comparison between what you've talked about and what they see in people in similar roles at the same level of you, yada, yada, yada. And through a group conversation, your bar raiser will try and get the group to a unanimous decision as to whether to hire you or not. Doesn't always happen. There does not have to be a unanimous vote. What happens at the end of that meeting is if a unanimous vote is there, great decision made. If not, the hiring manager and the bar raiser will talk to each other and take a view as to how they feel you are in terms of bar raising or not. If the hiring manager and the bar raiser think you're bar raising, then you'll get an offer. If the hiring manager thinks you're bar raising, but the bar raiser doesn't, you will not get an offer. If the hiring manager does not think you're bar raising, but the bar raiser does think you're bar raising, you're still not going to get an offer. That's the whistle stop tour of what happens. There are also some exceptions in rare occasions when a final decision can't be made at debrief, but I'm not going to cover those now. If you want to just double check what I've said and get some more nuances, please do go to the video on the channel about how the interview process works. Oh, whistle stop tour. Hope that made sense. Glenn, hello. Welcome, welcome. Okay, right. Okay. All right, code with Rohit. Okay, so this is going back to Rohit who asked a question earlier and I was utterly confused. Um, all right, so you are at the last round and you've got three interviewers, two of which, I don't know what TR is, but let's assume that that's kind of a colleague and one bar raiser, which is very interesting combination to only have three people and one of those to still be a bar raiser. But OK, as I said, all sorts of teams do things ever so slightly differently. All right. So and then you were wanting to know whether it will be behavioral only or whether it will be a combination. Right. OK, so it's for a support engineer. Right. It's very difficult for me to tell you exactly what you'll face, because as I said, different teams do things slightly differently. Some teams will test purely for technical in the early rounds and then knock that on the head and not bother with anything technical at all in the um, final kind of loop panel, whatever you want to call it. Other teams will actually do a combination of behavioral and technical in those final rounds. And some and sometimes they will do that combination in behavioral and technical by having a couple of interviews being purely one and a couple of interviews being purely another. Other times they will have each interview being a combination of technical and behavioral. I would suggest that you need to be prepared at loop because you've got so few interviews. Only three is a very small number. I'm assuming it is quite a junior role. You're saying it's a support engineer, too. I think you should assume that you will have both because there's not a lot of people talking to you and you haven't had a lot of interviews. And if you're Amazon, you want to at least make sure that um, given the small opportunity, you have to speak to this candidate that you've covered your bases. So I cannot tell you that there is a, as I've mentioned, a fixed way of doing this. There is not. But based on supposition, I would suggest that you be prepared for both, all of your interviews to be a combination of behavioral and technical. Good luck. I hope it goes well for you. Moving on then. OK. Luigi, you've got one week to prepare for the loop. What's it better for you to focus on? You really need to ask your recruiter. Um, it depends massively on what type of role you're interviewing for. To my point earlier with code with Rohit, uh, technical roles will have a combination of kind of functional and behavioral. Some roles won't have any kind of functional. They'll be much more focused on behavioral. At the end of the day, you have to be able to prove that you have the functional capabilities to do the role and you can raise the bar on the leadership principles. I can't tell you which one to focus on more because it's very dependent, number one, on you 
and your skills and where you are already at this moment in time. And also, obviously, depends on the role that you're doing. So my best advice to you is to speak to your recruiter and pump them for as much information as possible in terms of what you can expect in your interview. Luigi, be self-reflective. Are you strong on the technical side, but not so strong on the behavioral side or vice versa? I think a whole bunch of self-reflection is required here. But one way or another, particularly if you're in a technical role, you cannot ignore the behavioral piece, okay? So if you've got the technical side things nailed and you're in the technical space, I would say you really, really need to make sure that you understand the leadership principles that are gonna be key for your role. So please do check out a video that we have on the channel around uh, deconstructing your leadership principles from your job description, because that will narrow down the focus that you need for your leadership principles. Also, please do ask your recruiter to tell you what the key leadership principles are. Your odds are about 50-50 for them telling you or not. But any opportunity you can to narrow down your focus on which leadership principles are going to be key is going to be super valuable for you if you have a week left until loop. So I'm sorry, I know that's really high level and not particularly directional, but there's a whole bunch of extra information that I would need to know about you and your interview and your job in order to give you anything more specific. So I hope that at least gives you some direction. Okay. All right, Anchor, hello. So you're having a loop for a TAM, technical account manager next week. Uh, recruiter said there will be four rounds. You have eight years of experience. Should I expect L5, L6, or it depends on interview performance? Oh, I'm sorry, Anchor. It's all of the above, actually. <laughs> so you could be applying for a role that is an L5, and there is no scope and no budget to make it anything other than an L5. You may be applying for a role that's an L6, and they are not interested in hiring someone who is more junior than an L6. You may be interviewing for a team that has L5 and L6 roles and they are willing to be flexible and just find the right person and then, excuse me, I'm going to cough. Sorry about that. Um, they may be willing to find the right person and give them the right level role according to how they interview. So I don't know and the best person to ask, I'm afraid, is going to be your recruiter. Uh, usually, I would tell you that I believe a technical account manager would be an L5. Usually, a L6 would be a senior technical account manager. But particularly in AWS, sometimes they don't bother putting that qualifier ahead of their job titles. And sometimes, particularly kind of in um, account management roles, they tend to just give a single job title and then L5s and L6s can fit under that job title. So I give that to you with a little bit of caution. Usually if it doesn't have senior in front of it, it would be an L5 subject to AWS who kind of play their own little game when it comes to job titles. Speak to your recruiter, best way. Okay, moving on then. Okay. Hi again, Josh. Josh, you were here last week, weren't you? Totally remember you. So two teams are interested in you. Is it okay to use the same stories? Also, the loop will happen one at a time or intermixed. Okay, that was a question. Okay, trying to think how to keep track of stories. Right, let's break this down into two parts. So if you're asking me, will your loop be one loop for both teams or will they be separate loops? one for one team, one for another. I can't answer that question. You'll have to speak to your recruiter. The reason why I can't answer it is teams can make different choices. So quite often, if the teams that are interested in you are in the same business unit and are quite closely connected kind of organizationally, they might do what they call a split loop, as you indicate there, where they combine the loop and half of the people on the loop are from one team and half the people on the loop are from the other team. They collectively decide if you're bar raising and then they collectively decide which of the two roles do they think they would prefer to offer you. You might not always be offered both roles, even if the team considers you to be bar raising. Other teams, if they are not 
closely connected organizationally may choose to actually run their processes completely independently of each other and you'll have two completely separate loops two completely separate debriefs where the outcome of one has no effect on the outcome of the other there is no hard rules it will be up to those two teams to decide they should be aware that you are interviewing with both of them because they'll be able to see it on the system so they should be having these conversations I would suggest if you should reach out to your recruiter for either of those roles and ask is it going to be a split loop or will you be combining your two loops together um, is it okay to use the same stories okay so if you have a split loop um, then moot point right because it's just one loop if you have two different independent processes then i would say yes it's absolutely fine to use the same stories they couldn't expect you to be able to have enough stories you know you probably need to prepare let's say on average depending on what type of role you're going for it doesn't doesn't say it here but on average somewhere between 10 to 20 uh, examples if you're at the high end of that no one's going to can it possibly expect you to have 40 excellent high performance roles uh, stories ready to just churn out there so yes I would say if you're running two completely separate processes you can use the same stories I hope that helps moving on then Whoa. okay Thank you for your great videos. I'm charging 18,000 for preparing one for interviews. I wish, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what currency you're talking about here, but we, um, our fees at day one careers are in dollars and our charges are for our digital course, $225 for 10, no, 15 hours of digital content. And if you want coaching with a coach, it is $250 for a 90 minute session. So how I'm not sure what currency you're talking about in terms of 18,000, because if I was charging $18,000 for preparing for interview, I wouldn't be here. Maybe I would be here because I'd need to plumb up customers, but I would not be sitting in this house. That's for sure. I wish I made 18,000 on each individual customer. I'd be absolutely rolling in money. No, nowhere near that. But maybe you're talking about a different currency. Can you have an option to crack the interview first and pay fees once we clear it? No, that's not the way our business model works. Um, we have a digital model where um, it's very hands off. We price, you know, from a Western market point of view, incredibly competitively compared to our competitors. The truth is we give you the tools. It is an education solution that we provide at day one careers we don't provide any guarantees as regards whether you will or will not clear the loop there are so many variables associated as to whether you will or will not get the job some are totally out of your hands let alone being in our hands in terms of coaching so no I'm sorry that's not the way our business model works um, if you're interested in a business model like that there are other kind of coaches out there that will provide that type of a business model but you'll certainly pay them a lot more than the 225 dollars that our digital courses cost uh, again i have no idea where that 18,000 comes from man i wish i could make that type of money per customer Woo, i'd be rich um so there we are uh, hopefully that answers the question for you all right moving on then Ah, oh, Luigi, it's a senior technical account manager, in which case L6, right? L6. Okay, moving on then. Mm. Okay. Hello, right. So what's my recommendation on salary negotiations, verbally or written? Also, what would you cover on the written negotiation email? Okay, so... Um, at day one careers, we definitely recommend you conduct your negotiations wherever possible via email. The reason being, unless you're a really experienced negotiator and you are completely in control of what comes out of your mouth at every second, um, negotiating verbally is high risk. If you negotiate over email, obviously you can write something, think about it, look at it, ask yourself, can it be misinterpreted in any way? You're much more in control of yourself 
when you do it via email. What would I cover in a written negotiation email? Well, obviously that entirely depends on the nature of the negotiation itself. So there's no one answer to that. It would completely depend on the context. Um, at a high level, some of the things that we would recommend when you are negotiating is to have on hand any information that effectively represents how in demand you are. So if you have other offers, make that clear. Um, if you are in line for a promotion at your current role, make that clear. But you want to make sure that when you're negotiating, effectively, you have a good case for negotiating. Uh, same goes in terms of the actual value that you negotiate. You've got to have some data. So make sure that you kind of include in your data any knowledge that you have about the market rates, where have you got that information from. So it's, it's kind of a how long's a piece of string question you've asked me there. But there are some key things that you really need in your negotiation. And really, it's evidence, evidence that you are desirable, evidence that what you want to be paid is a fair request compared to what they're offering you at the moment, evidence for what you might be losing out on your current role if you move. So any bonuses that are coming your way, any RSUs that you wouldn't be able to vest, anything like that. But really, negotiation is all about leverage. So think about what leverage you have to convince them to pay you more money. I hope that helps. Okay, Javier, so you have a lot of years of experience and the role you're applying for is very, very junior. Will you still get a bar raiser? Um, well, whether you get a bar raiser or not is totally unconnected to you and your years of experience. Whether a bar raiser is going to be on your interview process or not is defined by the team and how they want to treat that particular interview process. So some you will get the same experience. So somebody won't, someone applying for the role that you're applying for will not be in a situation where they get a bar raiser and you don't. Right? You'll either both get bar raisers or neither of you will get bar raisers and that will be driven by the team's choice and process. Totally independent of anything to do with you, your experience, your skills, your years of experience, et cetera, et cetera. Hope that makes sense. Okay. What else do we have here? Hey, Q Cloud. So, if you've passed the screening process of Associate Cloud Engineer A2C and haven't been scheduled for a technical interview yet, does AWS end your hiring process without an interview? Well, they could end your hiring process without an interview if the role is no longer there, let's say. So, it is entirely possible that although you pass the screening test, that you know they don't need to interview you because now it's very dark in here. Christ. Um, they don't need to interview you because the role isn't there. So my suggestion is just to follow up with your recruiting team. Hopefully you have a number for your recruiter, an email address, should I say, for your recruiter, or at least an email address that someone has been communicating to you through. So don't assume anything. If you haven't heard from them, then feel free to follow up with a nice, polite chaser as to whether you're going to be hearing from them soon about your next round. Okay, I hope that helps. Oh, I've got someone who's got an offer, Detour. Congratulations, an L5 in the EU. You are absolutely welcome. I hope you have a fantastic Amazon career. All right, so. We're around the halfway, we're over the halfway mark here. There's a couple of questions left, but I just need to pause momentarily and ask if you would please do me a favor. Obviously, you'll see this channel. I put loads of effort, hours and hours and hours of work goes into just a couple of minutes. I know you wouldn't believe it, but trust me, hours of work goes into each individual one of those videos. And I give it to you and I really, really hope that you get benefit from it. In return, I have a tiny request and that is, Every time you watch one of um, our videos, please do give it a like, give it a thumbs up and or put a comment in, ask a question, say hi, Gigi. The reason why is that that's considered to be positive engagement signals from the YouTube algorithm's point of view. If you give it a positive engagement signal, the YouTube algorithm knows one, it's presented the uh, video to the right person and number two, that it's actually good content. 
By doing that, it will effectively promote us in the search for uh, videos on Amazon interview. Problem with the YouTube algorithm is it has a bias towards tenure. Uh, it promotes things that have more likes and more uh, comments. And obviously, things that have been around for a really long time have accrued more likes and more comments than recent stuff. So what happens in the search, I'm sure you've seen, is a whole bunch of really bad old content can surface um, high up from people who were never even Amazonians. So if you please do that for this channel, I'd really appreciate it. It will make sure that this current and very, very accurate content is making it to people who need it right now. So very briefly, I'm going to ask you to give this uh, particular video a, uh, a little like and we will spend a few seconds doing that. And whilst I do that, I'm going to play you a little video. So whilst I play this, please just just a little thumbs up. Tiny, tiny request. Thank you. There we go. Hopefully you enjoyed those two dancing versions of me. <laughs> I know it's a bit weird, but hey, gives you a couple of seconds to click the like button. So please, if you haven't, please, please, just a little thumbs up in return for my efforts. OK. Um, OK, this is interesting. Hey, Nitin. So you qualified for two loops. They asked you for a preference. You've given one and they're going to conduct a loop for that. If I don't qualify for the first, then will they conduct another loop? OK, so this is another example of teams kind of playing the game uh, differently. So we spoke to the person earlier who's doing two loops and they're running concurrently. And this these teams that you're working with Nitin have decided they don't want to do that. They're going to do one loop and then maybe another. Um, as is impossible for me to tell you, I'm sorry, I keep saying this, but, but it's not my ignorance. No one else would be able to tell you this either because it's going to be up to those teams. If, for example, you don't pass the loop on the first one, the reason why you don't pass the loop might determine whether they feel that they want to do a second loop. So if, for example, you don't uh, pass the loop on the first one because there are a couple of key leadership principles that are really critical for them to see you showing strength in, for that particular role that you don't, but you show strength in different leadership principles, well, maybe they'll conduct the second loop if the second role doesn't require those particular leadership principles that you didn't quite perform on for that team as their key leadership principles and where you did perform really well. If those leadership principles reflect what that second team want, then maybe they will conduct another loop. If you fail on leadership principles that the second team really want as well as the first team, they may not. So no single answer to this one, I'm afraid. I think what you just need to do is focus on doing the best job that you possibly can for the loop that you are going for. And then once that plays out, working out what to do next steps. This is out of your control in terms of how they're going to manage this process. So I would suggest you do not focus on the things that are not in your control, only focus the things that are in your control. So really, Focus on this one loop and doing the very best you can at this one loop. I have my fingers very firmly crossed for you. Good luck. OK. Oh, Nitin, it's you again. How much is the written assessment matter in the final decision of hiring? OK. Um, there's no weighted contribution in this. I get this question quite a lot, not just about the written assessment, but also the weighting between technical and behavioral. It doesn't work like that. The written assessment is there to prove that you are capable of writing a decent Amazon doc. There will always be developments and everyone that once you get in the inside, there's lots of work to be doing on writing skills. But nonetheless, the writing assessment is simply there to tick a box. It's a yes or no type decision. It has no weighted contribution to the final assessment. Sometimes, Rarely, a candidate may not do very well in terms of their writing assessment, but they may be incredible when it comes to their performance in terms of the leadership principle and the behavioral questions. And so the team may say, well, although this is a shocking written assessment, this is such a strong candidate in everything else. We think we can coach them on writing. Let's let them in. That may happen, particularly in roles where writing isn't critical, critical to the role. 
In other times, a candidate might bomb the writing, might be kind of average when it comes to the leadership principles, and they might say overall, look, just this com combination, throw in the fact that they can't string a sentence together and this is not a candidate that we want in the business. Equally, you might have someone who is, let's say, applying for a product manager position where writing is so important and they do raise the bar on the leadership principles, but their writing is abysmal. If I was a bar raiser in that situation, I would require huge convincing from a hiring manager that they would be able to ramp this person who cannot string a sentence together up quickly enough in terms of writing quality to make them a performant product manager in a reasonable period of time. So once again, there is no fixed rule about that. It will massively depend on the variables in terms of your performance in the actual interview itself and also the role that you're applying for. Okay, moving on. Ah, okay. Good question, Detour. Will the hiring manager be involved in any of the salary negotiations or is done 100% with the recruitment? You will only ever speak to the recruiter. You will not speak to anybody else about the actual negotiation for your compensation. In the background, the recruiter and the um, comp and benefits analyst, because actually the offer comes from a comp and benefit analyst, not from the recruiter and not from the hiring manager. There's this other person in the process who is the comp and bend analyst who actually produces the offer. They may talk to each other. Hiring manager has very little say in the actual offer itself. Unless the offer is super low and the hiring manager knows that you're never going to go for it, in which case they may push the comp and bends analyst to do better. Or if the offer, uh, the team feel that they want to uh, offer you something that is above band, the hiring manager may need to get involved to get approval from senior management to approve that. But generally, definitely you will never speak to anybody other than the recruiter and the hiring manager plays a very minimal role. I know it sounds crazy because in most other companies, hiring managers play a big role because they own the budget. In Amazon, hiring managers do not own their TLC budget, total labor cost budget, and therefore they don't actually get involved very much in the compensation negotiation. I hope that answers that question. All right. Okay, cool. Knit in. Looks like we're getting to the end of the questions, folks, which doesn't surprise me because we're a relatively small group. So if you have any more questions, please do bang them down. If not, we will wrap up a little bit early. Nitin again, bar raiser interview, is it always the last or can they conduct it in between? It is not always the last. It's just based on people's availability. So there's no particular sequence that interviews happen in. And there doesn't need to be because to my point a little bit earlier, all of the data is gathered together and discussed in one meeting at the end. So the sequence in which those interviews happen is totally irrelevant. So you will meet people purely based on the availability of their calendar. OK, so that said, it kind of looks like we are um, dried up in terms of questions. So what I'm going to do for you now is I said that I was going to give you an amazing freebie. So please do go to this URL here. Uh, this will give you a free one of our courses. It's the Customer Obsession Masterclass. And effectively, it literally tells you everything you need to know about Customer Obsession, right? It teaches you the four facets of Customer Obsession. So you've read the leadership principles. You see, they're big paragraphs, right? Well, within there, there are actually multiple different kind of versions of customer obsession and we've created a learning model at day one careers called facet to help you really understand each leadership principle and very easily identify examples from your past that fit that leadership principle it will also tell you what the interview is looking for in your answers like literally what the interview is looking for in your answers when it comes to customer obsession and also there is a mock interview there, me interviewing me showing you how the whole thing can come together in an actual interview itself it also gives you access to our free Discord community. We've got about, how many, 2,000, maybe more than 2,000 Amazon candidates in our Discord community at the moment. Obviously, not all active at the same time, but they help each other out. They ask each other questions. They get together and do mock interviews with each other. They learn about each other's experiences, what questions they were asked, what type of technical questions they're asked. Like, it's a great community there that really help each other. So even if you're not that interested in the course, which you should be, trust me, but even if you're not, 
sign up to it and you'll get access to that Discord community and you can work with uh, other people like you who are going through the same process as you. So I do urge you to go and take a look at that course. Okay, so that's it for today. For those of you who uh, managed to get roles, congratulations. Very, very proud of you. For those of you who have interviews coming up, fingers crossed, I wish you a very, very good luck. Uh, if you have further questions, feel free to drop them in the comments in any of the videos. Again, please, if you do watch any of our videos, just give it a little like. It, it really takes a millisecond on your part in return for at least three hours effort per video for me. Um, we would be very grateful. See you next week. Take care. Bye.